everyone. I'm Sarah Pearson. I'm a PhD candidate at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm in the Planetary Habitability and Technology Lab uh, in the Ocean Science and Engineering Department. Um, I go by Lola on the Element Chat. If you guys want to reach out or talk to me about anything after this uh, uh, presentation. But without further ado, I'm going to tell you guys today a little bit about wireless acoustic data transfer through ICE, facilitated through model integration with GNU Radio. So as you may have guessed by my title, my thesis work is in modeling realistic acoustic data transfer through ICE. Um, originally, this project began as an auxiliary communication system for future European drilling missions. For those who don't know too much about Europa or planetary science, Europa is a moon of Jupiter. This is the planet you see in the animation here. Um, this animation is a real compilation of photos from NASA, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can see the moons going around it. But my work uh, began focused on the one moon, Europa. Uh, you guys may have seen this image before as well. The only thing that we need to know is that Europa has a thick ice shell on the outside with a liquid water ocean uh, underneath. The idea is that if a lander is sent to the surface of Europa with a probe uh, that can drill through this 15 kilometer plus uh, ice shell, uh, then we would need a robust wireless communication system. And harsh polar environments on Earth offer a great analog for portions of Europa's ice shell. Uh, so this leaves us with the question of why. Why study the potential of an acoustic system? And the answer is that acoustic transducers have potential to be less power hungry than electromagnetic communication systems, and they are low frequency. Uh, this means long wavelengths, which lends itself to environmental robustness. Uh, in polar regions on Earth, we see ice that has impurities, uh, inclusions of water, salt, uh, salt crystals, air bubbles, cracks, you name it. Uh, in these unpredictable environments, uh, typically RF comms are attenuated too highly for long-range transmissions. So the more robust a system can be to these features, the better. Um, and even more exciting is that an acoustic data transfer system through ICE has potential for use as a positioning solution for under ice ROVs and AUVs, either remote operated uh, vehicles or autonomous underwater vehicles like the one you see here. Um, this is just a little plug for my lab. This is IceFin, the ROV of the lab I work in. Um, this robot gets put through a borehole in Antarctica and goes to swim around underneath the ice, taking all kinds of scientific data. Um, but one issue that IceFin and all other underwater, under ice vehicles encounter is that there is no GPS signal through ice. Um, leading to navigational or positional drift problems. So you can imagine why that would be treacherous for an expensive vehicle being sent to do uh, cool, cool work underneath the ice. So a low power wireless acoustic system that could communicate through both ocean water and ice has uh, exciting additional applications, not just outer planet ones. Um, but before we can talk about the model, sorry, my uh, notes here are not changing. There we go. Uh, we have to, if we want to talk about the origins of the acoustic model, um, we have to talk about ice characterization. Acoustic research of ice has been taking place since at least the 1950s, uh, and some of you may be familiar with one of the first techniques used, which is still used today in many fields, uh, impulse characterization. This is one of the easiest ways uh, to characterize a system, uh, simply at least with pretty robust results. Uh, this image on the right is an example of some acoustic data taken at Blue Glacier in Washington around 1965. Uh, the waveform was recorded after detonating a seismic blasting cap near the surface with the receiving hydrophone in like a 50 meter borehole next to it at 2.5 meters away. Um, but speaking of characterization, as time went on, it became more complex. So researchers immersed transducers in boreholes and propagated signals both vertically and horizontally in ice, recording data for frequency sweeps and sine waves and etc. Uh, careful analysis of ice sections were conducted, resulting in a comprehensive understanding of ice crystal growth and how ice crystal geometry changes with respect to the environment in which it was found. Uh, and finally, at least one of the last things I'm going to talk about as far as um, analysis goes, um, analysis was also conducted on ice cores, giving us a better understanding of the structure and entrainment of impurities in ice. Um, here's an example of just a piece of one of the longest ice cores ever drilled, which was over three kilometers long. It's just wild. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and with all of this analysis and data, researchers were able to find empirical equations to characterize parameters of interest in ice. Things like sound speed, which is dependent on the direction of travel, as I mentioned before, um, longitudinal or transverse. Uh, the crystal structure, what kind of grain boundaries are we dealing with? Um, how many air bubbles are in the ice? What kind of uh, impurities are in it? How much salt does it have in it? Et cetera. So it's using uh, these empirical equations that an acoustic model can be put together. 
So we know about the characteristics of ice, and we've identified their acoustic effects, but how do these measurements turn into an acoustic model within the context of an entire system? Uh, a nice way to describe it all concisely, I think, is a link budget, where uh, PR and PT receive and transmitted power, P is path loss, A is attenuation loss through the media, T is transducer loss, and C is coupling loss. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this. Um, but attenuation loss in and through the media of sound propagation is the model backbone. This is where the empirical equations for through ice characterization come into play. Attenuation loss in ice is a few major contributors, which I mentioned in passing. Um, absorption, grain boundary scattering, air bubble attenuation, and salt attenuation. Um, you can think of these components almost like a channel model. Now, before I explain how I integrated um, this channel model of sorts with GNU Radio, I want to take a step back and reiterate that my goal in utilizing, in using GNU Radio with uh, this research work is to have a customizable and easy to use test bed that would allow me to test and ultimately optimize the data transfer capability of a wireless acoustic system through specific types of ice. Um, with that being said, this is where we finally get to talk about GNU Radio. So first I started with an out of tree module and within that module, each component of attenuation was turned into a block. Uh, each block has a few parameters that represent the environment of interest. I won't spend too much time explaining each of the parameters, um, but the important takeaways are that one, attenuation is usually uh, strongly uh, linked to frequency. So frequency is the input to the blocks in the flow graph. And two, the user-defined parameters of each block are bounded for most locations of interest on Earth. And what I mean by that is if you wanted to model a temperate glacier or sea ice or Antarctic ice, there's very likely data available to you that will give you an upper and lower limit on what those uh, user input parameters should be. And this is one of the major features of the acoustic model. Because the blocks can be cascaded and the input's customized, attenuation through different kinds of ice can be computed if you just uh, input your particular ice parameters. So this is just a simple flow graph that you can use, um, you know, input a source that represents frequency, have the blocks just there, and you can see the attenuation total that comes out on the right-hand side. In the time sink, it comes out in um, decibels per meter. Pardon me, technical difficulty. Um, and here is an example of how you would integrate the attenuation blocks into a larger system. This is an FSK modulated flow graph uh, modified from Barry Dugan's tutorial, thank you Barry, um, using the acoustic attenuation blocks. Uh, which are highlighted in the yellow box. So again, the acoustic model is an aggregation of equations turned into blocks, put together into GNU radio such that a modulation scheme can be applied. Um, this is the novel part of my research. Very recently, a couple researchers have sent modulated data through ICE, um, but modeling and trying to optimize that process hasn't been done. So what this flow graph does, I'm sure a lot of you guys are already familiar, it takes a source, this could be a text file, um, random source, etc and modulates the data. A PLL frequency detector is used to pass the acoustic attenuation blocks that input frequency that they need. Uh, and the blocks calculate the attenuation in dBs based on that frequency and a few input parameters. And finally, the dB reduction is calculated and applied to the amplitude of the signal using another block I made here um, called dB reduced received signal. And then the rest of the flow graph carries out the demodulation. And finally, we are on to the model results. So note that while I just showed you guys an example of how to use the blocks in a flow graph that includes a modulation scheme, right now the model isn't perfect. Um, and it's going to continue to be updated and constrained, hopefully with some benchtop lab setups in the near future, until it gets to a point where, uh, where it's within, sorry, until it gets to a point where within the frequency range of interest, uh, we're getting the level of accuracy desired. Um, so before I begin to explain these plots, it's important to point out that my model is only valid for 1 to 100 kilohertz, uh, but the frequency ranges of interest for acoustic communications through ICE are estimated to lie in between the 5 to 35 kilohertz range. Uh, I'm comparing to acoustic attenuation through uh, sea ice here. These values were calculated by Lang-Levin in 1969 on the left-hand side. Uh, notice that while my data on the right has the same curve as the Lang-Levin data, we actually have a higher attenuation calculated. Um, the acoustic model works well for 1,000 to about 50,000 hertz, um, but at 55 kilohertz, we get a true divergence uh, that starts occurring. Here I plot Lang-Levin's data in bold on my own plot. We have a four decibel difference at this location that grows with the frequency value. 
Um, I have thoughts on what this might be, but I, I think I'm headed a little bit over time. I'm getting close to it at least. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh. Sorry, I was talking a little bit faster than I expected then. Um, well, I can, I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, it is very possibly due to uh, the, the salt types or how thick the ice was that they were transmitting through. I have a couple ideas on, on why that might be the case, and that'll be incorporated into the model as I continue updating it. Uh, moving on to glacier data conducted by Westfall. Notice that the simulated results in purple are actually about uh, an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude lower than the experimental result. Excuse me. Oh, no, no, just one. Pardon me. Also notice the pink line of data. This is the same as the data in purple, just multiplied by a factor of 10. Um, here it is just a little bit closer. So we have an anomaly in the 2 to 4 kilohertz range uh, and a little divergence at the tail end. But generally, the researcher Westfall hypothesized that Raleigh scattering was the main contributor to the attenuation he calculated at Blue Glacier. Um, and to a decent extent, we see that mirrored in the simulation data, if only it were the order of magnitude larger across the board. Um, and I think this may actually be due to something that Westfall calls lensing in his paper. Um, at his field site, the ice had significant and distinct layering. Um, there was extremely coarse ice. There was very bubbly ice that was described as um, nearly opaque. It was described as looking like porcelain almost. And then fine, almost transparent ice. Um, so the additional attenuation due to an interface change of that type could be around an order of magnitude based on what I've seen in the literature. But this is another area of improvement for the model moving forward. And finally, this is uh, an example of my model compared to Antarctic ice. This data is from SPATS, the South Pole uh, Acoustic Test Setup. If you guys haven't ever heard of that project, um, it's really cool. They uh, were like the precursor to a neutrino observatory set up in Antarctica. So some really interesting work there. This team calculated attenuation for horizontal propagation through Antarctic ice with respect to depth. Um, the ice near the surface was reported to be just slightly warmer than the ice deeper down. This is why we see the slight decrease um, in the pink triangles on the right-hand side. That is my data, and that's how it compares to theirs. So pretty decent in Antarctic ice. And uh, and that was uh, the info I have to wrap up my talk. Um, as far as future work goes, I plan to update the code uh, in the ways I mentioned briefly when I was talking about the model results. Uh, but I also hope to be able to account for in the future uh, TVR or OCRR um, and some phase change information if possible. Uh, but this information is not something I found in the literature for through ice transmission. So it's likely that this is something I would have to document in the lab myself or in the field um, in a, on a benchtop lab setup, I mean. And I also have plans to work with a low power transducer in the frequency ranges of interest uh, with a colleague at Georgia Tech uh, who has developed a low power um, cheap transducer in that frequency range. So be on the lookout for some hopefully interesting results here at, at very soon. And I just look forward to talking to everyone about this stuff. If you guys are interested, uh, I'll be around. I would love some suggestions on how to make my model better using currently existing GNU radio blocks. Uh, if anyone you know knows a little bit more about those than I do, I'm a little bit familiar, but I'm sure I could learn more. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any uh, suggestions or ideas, feel free to ping me on Element, because I am on that chat somewhat frequently. And uh, that is it for my, my talk today. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one quick question and the next speaker could also already prepare other questions. All right. Hello, yeah, thanks first. Uh, I always love it when we have talks here that aren't like the classical radar com, so that was cool. Can you, can you say a little, Thing. Can, so I missed the second. I was like, it came in a bit late. So maybe you said something about it. But like those transducers, can you very quickly say something about those? And is there a does would it make sense to pull you know them directly into Gunner Radio so you could like start I don't know pinging or I don't know exactly what they do. Like are they just like microphones and and loudspeakers or is there more to that? Sorry, you're talking about um, how it is that this data was taken. I 
having a hard time. It's, it's, so, so I don't know exactly how those 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 those, those sonic tr sony sonic sona transducers oh, work. The seismic blasting caps. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could just like talk about the the, the Yeah, sure. What I was talking about at the beginning. Yeah, they they are quite literally just explosive charges that were used back in the day um, to have this impulse uh, sent through the ice that could be recorded very easily with a hydrophone. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So thanks to the speaker once again.